I have constructed you in my brain. When one says the word afterlife, I think most people immediately assume it's a religious concept, right? And, and the first sort of question here is, actually, could it be part of a scientific account? And what could that look like? And I'd like to invite you all, particularly you, Nick, because I'm <laughs> curious. I should also say, disclaimer, I'm a scientist too, and I'm a biologist as well. So I, I, have, I have a sort of perspective on this thing as well. But I'd really love to see what we all think could actually happen in this, like how can an afterlife exist, scientifically speaking? And what, what might that look like? Like what is an afterlife really in that secular view? Um, I mean, I, I think the first thing to realize about science is that there, there is no monolithic view of science and we don't know. Uh, you started out saying we don't know what consciousness is. Uh, and that's true. I think we have ideas what it is, but nobody can agree. No two people working on consciousness will agree about what it is anyway. So to say we haven't a clue is wrong, but to say that there's an agreed <laughs> um, solution to it, if you like, is, is, is wrong. Now, uh, I suppose if, if there is, from my, personally, I see it as tied to organic matter, as tied to, the, 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 to cells and to, to animals. But if, if it were not, um, then I suppose the, the idea of panpsychism, that uh, consciousness is linked in some way to a property of matter that we know little about, and there's plenty we don't know about matter still, so it's, it's easy to put two mysteries together and then s think that we've solved something. But I know a lot of people, and perhaps some people in this room, um, would, would, would see consciousness not as a property of a body, but something which is linked then with the wider universe, with fields of some description. Uh, to my mind, um, electromagnetic fields are an extremely important part of consciousness. There's been very little uh, explored so far. I think that the 21st century biology will be a, a lot of it about the biology of fields. I would see those fields as not necessarily going very far beyond the limits of the boundary, and I personally don't see those fields as linking with the universe. But some very good scientists, and I notice Rupert Sheldrake is here, and I've probably not captured anything like his view on this, but it, perhaps it would be something closer to that. I do not think that we have um, a scientific answer to that question. I have a bias. Other people have different biases, and we don't know the answer. But it's not impossible. I mean, I have to ask you all, because obviously you've all touched upon the consciousness thing. Can I just clarify? When we talk about an afterlife, are we literally talking, like, is that an afterlife for the consciousness or is that an afterlife for another part of ourselves? Like, is, is it specifically about the co our consciousness as we recognize it? Is that, is that a consensus or is that even up for debate? Uh, well, there are all sorts of language issues. And, uh, but what I, think, what, I think, what I think is part of what's happening here is that we think that we've kind of dumped the, f the religious framework. Um, uh, that there's something inside us that's going to continue beyond that. But I, I think that carries on. And I think that carries on in all sorts of ways. So we have that kind of, um, the, the thing, we set up this debate by saying, like, we, like, I can't remember the phrase, but, you know, kind of risible religious ideas. And uh, the, the, the model for that might be something like, uh, there's this immortal thing in us that will outlast this mortal thing, which is our body. Um, and um, I think that is kind of rolling forward in the, in the consciousness debate. I use the word consciousness because it's kind of, I think it's more accessible. Soul has its own connotations, right? Um, uh, but uh, for me, uh, I think, um, and I speak as, as a Christian, uh, what I read in my own tradition is that the body is very important. So I'm unwilling to, as it were, make that move. I think it, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a true, uh, well, I don't think it's a fair representation of the center of my own tradition. I think it's a kind of bastardization of it, uh, that there's this immortal thing in us, which is spinning out in one direction or the other. Um, so it, it like, uh, what Nick's saying about the, the importance of the body and it, uh, and whatever it is, our consciousness, I think consciousness probably gets to that e idea better than soul our so we could we with the, our, with the language of soul we're trapped in that absolute distinction between the flesh and this thing inside us so if you ask a clinical scientist what's the difference between religion 
and spirituality, we would use a twin study. Using a twin study, twins raised together, twins raised apart, factoring out their commonality as a function of genes and environment, we can determine the extent to which any human trait is inborn or environmentally formed. Religion is a gift of our parents and grandparents, our community. Religion is 100% environmentally transmitted. We might choose a religion and immerse ourselves. Spirituality is innate. Every single one of us is born with an innate seat of spiritual awareness. How much so? By the time we're adults, 30% innate. It is our birthright. And yet, two-thirds environmentally formed. For many, the two-thirds is the rich embrace of a religious tradition. For others, it is through art and poetry. But every one of us is born a spiritual being. Now, let's take that down one more level to MRI studies. What is the inheritance? that is ours, that is innate, our birthright. There is a neuro docking station, an innate seat of transcendent awareness with which we are all endowed. In a culture that has silenced multiple forms of knowing, multiple organic epistemologies, we don't hear much in K-12 or in the boardroom about the deep neuro seat of transcendent perception. But you are not an innately spiritual being due to your belief but rather due to your ability to perceive and know. This is a form of human perception. At the inner table, we have a logician. We have, of course, a skeptic, who's most welcome. We have an empiricist, a mystic, an intuitive. And when we can bring all knowers into tandem, we see in our MRI studies interconnections, myelinating the tracks highways between forms of knowing for a more innovative, situationally aware, creative brain. This is a room full of artists and writers. You have a highly interconnected brain. I might even venture to guess that the muse or some form of transcendent knowing may have informed one of your creations. If you ask scientists, <laughs> if you ask a scientist, 70% of scientists who have made a meaningful contribution in their field report that while the rollout of science, perfectly good lens, was quite logically driven, the inspiration, the question through which they broke ground was a proverbial apple on the head from here. It was a form of transcendent experience, dream, mystical experience, synchronicity. We're more, we are knowers in multiple forms, and when we own all forms of knowing, we are ready to move forward. You will not have the problems we have now, new generation. You won't need to solve them. They won't happen in the first place. I mean, yeah, I mean, feel free to jump in if, if you um, I mean, I, uh, again, I completely agree. You know, science to me is a very creative uh, endeavor, it, far more so perhaps than most non-scientists would assume and also than society would give it credit for. And to me, uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of my day is trying to imagine how things might be. And occasionally something pops into my mind and I don't know where it comes from. And this is what you're calling transcendence. I'm putting it very badly, but... So I, I'm not disputing at all that these things exist and are real and feel very real. But this world around us, all, <laughs> all you guys out there, uh, you're not out there, you're in here. I have constructed you in my brain. There is no, you know, <laughs> any tree that I see over there, everything, everything I see in the world around me, you're not physically in my head. What's in my head is a bunch of neurons, a bunch of electrical wiring, and so on. And, and it's put together in a way that we can barely understand, and it constructs a world. And we interact with that world during early development. We walk into trees, we hurt ourselves, we, we, we figure out that that is not moving, it's bigger than me, and it hurts. Um, and, and, and so we, we piece together the world. And if you keep someone in a, I mean, apparently this kind of thing happens, keep someone in a dark room until they're six or something, they never can see properly because they, you know, the, the, the neuron, the synaptic connections in the mind is too late for them. That plasticity of forming the links to understand what you're seeing is too late. So if the mind, and clearly it is because it is for absolutely everyone here, capable of constructing this astonishing world. What a beautiful part of the world that we're in. You know, we, we are able to construct all of this in our heads and we can agree about what's out there. Um, so what happens when some of this goes wrong? I know for a fact that my mind is capable of constructing an amazing world. It doesn't surprise me very much that it's also capable of constructing all kinds of horrors, uh, all kinds of uh, all forms of me you know, mental derangement in one way or another, and it will happen to me, I don't doubt it. So 
I don't see a need again to believe that it's coming from somewhere else. I see my own mind as capable of doing things that I cannot understand, but it doesn't mean to say it's coming from over there. It means it's coming from in here, to my mind. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.